salvation. Together, draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Please be seated. Let me pass the time over to Pastor Ben. Thank you, Song Tiam. Song Tiam leads us in worship uh, unto the Lord in singing, but he also leads our floral ministry team, even as we offer floral worship unto the Lord as well. So thank you, Song Tiam. Today for our sermon, we do have a guest preacher. He's not really a guest because uh, he is one of our own, and many of you actually know him. He's none other than Mr. Daniel Lee. Uh, he is pursuing his PhD in the Old Testament now with the University of Cambridge. And uh, he has now come back in his last year, uh, so he will soon to be Dr. Daniel Lee. And so we are glad that he's come here to share God's Word with us from the Old Testament. Uh, while he was studying in uh, Cambridge, uh, he got married to his wife, Faith, and they recently have a new, do new daughter, a daughter, uh, Sophie. And Sophie is uh, wisdom in uh, Greek, no, Latin, Greek, in Greek. Yep. So while he's studying, he has a lot more faith and wisdom now. <laughs> and so we are glad to welcome Mr. and soon-to-be Dr. Daniel Lee. <laughs> Thank you. What a fantastic introduction. <laughs> Pastor Ben can be a stand-up comedian very soon. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, is the mic okay? Okay, good to be back. I was uh, here on staff at Topayo for four years. I'm a member here. And uh, as Pastor Ben has shared, I'm uh, currently in my final year of PhD in Old Testament at Cambridge University in the UK. Um, I was sent by Topayo and Trinity Theological College, TTC. That's the seminary where most of our pastors and uh, pastoral team are trained uh, so that I may return to teach Old Testament and Hebrew at TTC. Uh, and uh, throughout my studies, I'm so grateful for TPMC's financial and spiritual support. Uh, I was especially moved uh, last year when uh, Pastor Ming and Pastor Tsuhui, they were up in London for a conference and they brought a whole cabin bag of uh, local premixes and sauces all the way up for us. And we were, oh, we were so <laughs> touched and moved. You have no idea how important these things are, you know, in the UK. Uh, so hard to find these things and very expensive. And uh, as Pastor Ben has also shared, uh, I'm married now and uh, my daughter was born in the UK this February. Her name is Sophie. And here I have a picture of them. Yeah. <laughs> She's so cute. Can I not? Audrey, this photo can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. She's a very, very happy baby, very smiley. And uh, most importantly, she's very healthy, uh, thank God. But actually, for a while, it seemed like we would not have Sophie for very long. Uh, we were at our first ultrasound scan in the UK, and uh, it was a difficult first trimester for my wife, Faith. And at first, we were so happy, you know, because we could finally see Sophie on the screen, you know. Well, she was just like a blob <laughs> on the ultrasound. <laughs> um, and we could hear her heartbeat. They amplified the, the, the thing for us, so we could hear the heartbeat. Uh, but one of the markers tested high for genetic disorder uh, that is linked to major organ defects and developmental problems. And uh, so this marker is, uh, in the worst case scenario, uh, Sophie may not make it past one year of life. So, of course, now by the grace of God, Sophie is now born and we have checked and everything is fine now. But at that time, this was a, a risk, a probability. Um, and so the medical professionals were preparing us for the possibility that Sophie might either have lifelong disability at best or at worst, um, die soon after birth. And so the counsellor who spoke to us told us to consider abortion even. And so what do you do with such news? 
At first, uh, I tried to be strong, you know, oh, you know, it's just, it's just a chance, you know, it's just a probability, you know, it'll be fine, the doctors don't know as much as God, God will overcome the odds and make Sophie fine, you know, yeah, we'll believe it. But the result is the result, you know, the doctors did tell us that, and of course, being human, you know, you start to imagine the worst as well, you know, and then very soon you are on this roller coaster of emotions. Uh, and I remember the next thing that happened was I started to question myself, like, oh my, what did I do wrong? Uh, why, is, why would Sophie have something like this? Did I do something wrong? And then it moved on to, uh, I started to question God, you know? Uh, what is this? How could you allow this to happen to such an innocent little girl and my daughter? How could you allow her to die like this? What wrong did she do? She hasn't even been born. Where is the justice in this? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I follow you. You know, I, I, I'm doing full-time ministry. Why, how could you do this to us? And so like the persistent widow, you know, I just kept knocking, you know, calling for justice. And I was crying and crying so much. And in my tears, I challenged God and I railed against Him and I actually found myself angry at God. It just felt like either He couldn't or He wouldn't do anything. How is a God-fearing and Bible-believing Christian supposed to respond to this kind of news? How is one who has faith supposed to receive this message? In the Bible, we have an example of someone who experienced something similar or actually far worse, and that's the person of Job. You see, I almost lost Sophie, but Job actually lost all his children and more than that. And so for the rest of my sharing, I want to explore the human response to suffering and the nature of God, looking at what is perhaps a more unfamiliar chapter, chapter 3 of the book of Job, because, you know, it's there in our Bible, and, and once in a while it's good to go to uh, all the books of our Bible to know a little bit about it. And so first, let me summarize the story of Job. The Bible says, Job is blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So he is, like, you know, the most righteous man. But almost at once, through no fault of his own, First, he lost all his assets, all his uh, sheep and, and, and everything. And then he lost all his children. And then he was also physically afflicted with boils. That's the story. The point of the story is that everything bad that could possibly happen to anyone happened to Job through no fault of his own, the Bible emphasizes. Now, how did Job respond to this? At first, Job was strong and steadfast. He declared that he came into the world with nothing, and so he will leave with nothing. He rebuilt his wife. I think that's the picture of the wife back there. Um, for just accepting good from God, but not accepting suffering from God. And then his three friends came to visit him. Uh, those are the three friends. And they were so distraught by, God, by Job's suffering that no one said anything for a week. They just sat there. But through it all, it says at the end of chapter 2, Job did not blame God for what happened, and the Bible says he did not sin with his lips. Now, if this is where the book ends, Job chapter 2, then, you know, we... Would, uh, it seems like this kind of behavior would be exactly what we should do. Just accept, endure, don't complain, don't question, don't challenge. But then comes chapter 3, which is our text for today. And in chapter 3, suddenly it is as if a different man emerges, a different Job emerges. In this Job in chapter 3, he does not just accept and endure and he will not stay silent anymore. In fact, this Job will go on to lament for the best part of the next 29 chapters of the book. 
And of course, today we cannot cover all of Job's speeches in the book. We won't even consider one whole chapter. We will just consider a few key verses from chapter 3. And so let's go into Job chapter 3. After this, uh, this is uh, Job chapter 3, verse 1. After this, it means the whole week of silence from Job and his friends. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. Job said, May the day in which I was born perish, the night which one said a man is conceived. That day, let there be darkness. May God above not be concerned with it, nor light shine on it. Now here, Job wishes that the day in which he was born perishes. The night in which he emerged from the womb never should have come into being. In other words, he wishes he was never born. He wishes he doesn't exist. On the surface, he seems respectful. He does not curse God. He curses the day of his birth. But commentators have noted very strong language in the next verse. Verse uh, 4, that day, let there be darkness. You see that? That day, let there be darkness. Now, you may not get the sense in the English, but in the Hebrew, and that's why it's important for Bible teachers to learn biblical languages, let there be darkness is phrased exactly the same way as Genesis 1, the creation story, where it says, let there be light. If you remember in Genesis 1 uh, verse 3, God called, uh, sorry, on the first day of creation when darkness still covered the face of the deep, creation began with God's words, let there be light. And God called that light day and it was good. But here Job reverses that, he mocks that. Job actually says for that day, let there be darkness instead. And so Job is actually calling for God to undo his creation. There was darkness and then God called light. But Job now says, let there be darkness again. Go back. Job is implying that God's creation is in fact not so good. God should just reverse what he did. Because of all that he's going through, all the suffering that's going on, Job lost confidence in God's control, and questions if God really knows what he's doing. Job scorns the goodness of God's creation by suggesting that God should not have been the one to create in the first place. Now, hold on a minute. We are more used to the Bible saying, oh, creation is good and God is good, therefore. But here in the Bible, there is a verse that says, uh, the creation perhaps is not so good. God, maybe you should not have created in the first place. Let there be darkness again. Quite remarkable that it implies the opposite of what we're used to hearing in the Bible. And so Job thinks, well, the creation is not as good as it is made out to be. How is it good considering what happened to me? When I lost all my assets, all my children, all my health. If this is what you call good, then perhaps there should have not have been any creation at all. And then, in the chapter, goes, uh, Job goes on to tell God what else he did not do right. Verses 11 and 16. Why did I not die at birth, Job says? Come forth from the womb and expire. Or why was I not buried like a stillborn child, like an infant that never sees the light? Job is indirectly saying to the God who holds all life in his hands, if you were going to let me go through all this suffering, then I should not have been born. You made a mistake, God, by letting me live from that day. I should just have died when I came out from my mother's womb. Can you imagine a Bible verse saying this? God should have let someone die at birth. We are more used to quoting Psalm 139, oh, fearfully and wonderfully made, you know? And all our paths, you know, are made up for us. But here, 
uh, Job is really skeptical that God is in control of his life. Because what control is this? When all his assets are lost, all his children is lost, are lost, and his health is lost. If it had come to this, Job says, then my life should just have ended on day one. Job challenges God's sovereignty over events. But Job goes on. Since you've allowed me to go through all this suffering, Job continues, Verses 20 and 21. Why is light given to one in misery and life to the bitter in soul? Who longs for death, but it does not come and searches for it more than hidden treasures. Job is saying, I am so miserable and bitter right now. Why is life still given to me? I want to die right now. I want to die. I long for death more than for hidden treasures but it does not come. Again, we are more used to invoking biblical blessings for long life, right? But here is a text where the person is asking God uh, to let him die straight away. Job is telling the God who determines each person's coming and going, you let me keep living, but actually you don't know that I am now better off dead. You don't know who to keep alive and who to die. Job here questions God's fitness to control and to determine life. Now, we just took a very quick skip through Job chapter 3. But if we take a step back right now and look at what Job chapter 3 is saying, that God's creation should not have been. He should have just reversed creation or just not do anything that God's sovereignty over events is not as in control as what is made out to be. And God's fitness to control life is questioned. All these things in Job chapter 3, it's actually quite remarkable that such verses even exist in our Bible. Because this is one chapter that undermines God's sovereignty, purpose, and control. Things that are emphasized all over the Bible. This is one chapter that will never make it into our memory verses, I bet. This is one chapter that will never make it into the lyrics of our worship songs. Who's going to sing, let there be darkness instead of let there be light? Who's going to sing, I should have died at birth? I want to die right now. It just, it won't be. And so what in the world is this chapter doing, this blasphemous chapter doing in God's holy word? Now, this is where scholars are calling the book of Job protest literature, protest literature. The book of Job knows other biblical truths. The book of Job, of course, knows that God is sovereign, God controls all life, God is in control. But the book of Job questions our experience of these truths in the face of suffering. Because when difficult things happen, we know in our heads, God is in control. But the reality around us, we don't feel that at all. Things are going out of control. And so the reason this chapter exists in our Bible, along with so many other laments and complaints, especially in the Old Testament, is that, well, God's Word reflects God's character. And in the depths of our suffering, God does not expect us to always be strong and to always be able to affirm that He is in control. But when difficult situations come, God allows us and even invites us to be honest, to tell Him to His face what we really feel. Because how can it be that every single day we are so ready to affirm that God is in control? When we suffer, God does not require us to pretend that we are still happy and strong, but we have the space to cry out, to doubt, to question, to challenge. And so the purpose of passages like Job chapter 3 is not to give us more right theology, but it is to identify with our human suffering and give voice to our anguish. 
And because of such chapters, like Job chapter 3, we are allowed, you may say, or we may even say invited, we are invited to honestly express our hearts to God when things seem to spiral out of His good order. Now, I'm not referring to those who rebel and who defy and insult God. These people uh, will be punished, of course. But I'm referring to the devout and the sincere and the faithful who experience suffering, suffering way beyond what they are used to and able to cope with. And for them, we know that it is okay to challenge and question God in their dark times. And we know this because of what happens in the story of Job, righteous Job. You see, in the end, God didn't punish Job for complaining, for doubting, and for challenging God. But many chapters later, after Job and his friends finished their so-called dialogue, but actually they're all talking past each other, um, you know, and God appears. God encounters and reveals himself to him, encounter. God encounters him after Job opens up honestly to God. Now, of course, there is no time for a detailed study of uh, God's response to Job, four chapters, uh, but here I will quickly explain the key points. After a long dialogue between Job and his friends, God suddenly appears, uh, and at the beginning of Job chapter 38, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, saying, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you will make known to me. Where were you when I established the earth? Say, if you have understanding, if you know understanding. And so for four chapters, all God does is rattle off the wonders of creation. Now, how is that an answer to Job's suffering? Job was asking God, why, why am I going through all this? But God just says, well, tell me, were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I created this and I created that? In fact, God does answer Job, but kind of indirectly, not in the way he expected. You see, Job, at the, very, uh, at the very basis, was questioning God's fitness as a creator. But God answers uh, Job in questions. God asks Job pointedly, are you the creator then? Do you know, method, do you know better than me? Do you not see that there is a well-ordered universe that I have created? Are you then able to create the same order that I have? This well-ordered universe that we live in is testimony of God's sovereignty and control. And God is trying to say that when we look at creation, the wonders of creation, we can trust Him always to bring order into our lives of chaos. And when Job understood this, God could restore Job at the end of the book. And so the book of Job uh, tells us that by being honest to God, protesting with him even, God revealed himself to Job and countered him. And that was the beginning of Job's restoration. And so similarly, back to my story, when I challenged God and I asked I asked God why Sophie had to be afflicted. Why is this happening? A few days later, he answered me. Um, but like Job, God did not answer in the way I expected. I, I, I expected answers. Why? Why is Sophie suffering? But instead, God told me, you plead for Sophie's life as though she is yours. But actually, I gave her to you. She is mine. And you are mine. And I am God, and I control even your very breath. I give and I withhold life as I please, because I am God. You can ask my wife, but when I heard that, I broke down. Because through that, I learned the most important lesson that one can ever learn. That all life belongs to God. I don't even have a claim over my own life. What more 
over Sophie's life. And so through this honest struggle with God, I also came away with a deeper understanding of who God is and how I want to live the rest of my life for His glory. And I will teach Sophie to do the same. And so, friends, I know that there are some among us, for ourselves or for our loved ones, we have experienced afflictions, diseases, losses, including uh, miscarriages, which we don't normally talk about in church. And perhaps we haven't quite raised the issue with God. We still have questions for Him. We still want to ask Him the very deep questions. We avoid bringing it to God in prayer because we are perhaps afraid of losing our faith. Or perhaps we have fought the good fight of faith, praying for a good outcome, but that outcome never came. And that put a strain on our relationship with God. And sometimes it feels like coming to church can be such a great pretense because we have to put on a front that everything is fine with God and us, but actually it is not. Actually, inside we are angry, disappointed, upset with God. But the lesson of Job 3 encourages us, my friends, to be honest with God. And Job 3 gives us the space to question, challenge, and cry out to God in our suffering. Because in the depths of our despair, God does not need us to pretend that we are fine, that we have faith, that we are strong. But God would like to meet us wherever we are. God would like us to be honest to Him, even if it means protesting to Him, because it's a part of our spiritual journey and our spiritual walk and our spiritual growth with Him. We can come to Him and ask Him life's most difficult questions. And He will reveal Himself to us. He will encounter us. He will strengthen us and build us up from there. At this point, perhaps maybe we can all be silent for a little while. We can bring to God some issues that we have yet to do business with Him on. So with all eyes closed, heads bowed, let's offer to God all our struggles, all our despair, all the questions that should have been asked a long time ago but have not been asked. Let's think about these things and know that God is listening. God knows our weaknesses. God does not require us always to repeat and affirm right theology. But God allows us to be vulnerable and weak because He knows what it's like to be human. He came down in human form to meet and to address all our needs. Come to Him in all honesty Asking Him, why? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to someone I care about? What is going on, God? Tell me, teach me, help me to trust you again. Questions that have been held back for too long, bring it to God.
friends, this may be the beginning of a process that may take weeks or months or even years to resolve. And Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord, today for the lesson of Job 3. Thank you, Lord, that you are not a God who, ex- who just shoves right theology down our throats to say, no, you must affirm all these things. You must always say that God is in control. But the Bible tells us and reveals to us that God does not expect us to always be strong. That God knows that we are weak and God knows that our suffering can be so great sometimes. And God allows us to cry out. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your kindness and your compassion. Thank you that we can bring our struggles to you like this. Thank you, Lord, that eventually we know that you will give us an answer. We know that you will reveal to us. Help us, Lord, to remain open, to hear sometimes perhaps things that are difficult to hear. But Lord, we know that you will always meet us We thank you that you are Creator God, you are in control. And thank you, Lord, that we can trust you with our lives, that we can trust you to bring the good back from the chaos that we may be experiencing in different ways. And so, we give thanks to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.